Okay, so we are taking a little bit more time today on the review of some of the things that are going to appear on your exam. So I certainly want you to take advantage of that. And uh, one of the things is uh, that I think is helpful when we do a review is a timeline. And so I'm going to put a timeline up. And I'm going to start it over here about at... Uh, 539 BC. So let's put BC and I'm going to put 539. This is when Cyrus the Great conquered Babylon. And so he does that. Remember, he uh, reroutes the Euphrates River. And so uh, his army goes through the river gate into the city. And that's. Um, 539 B.C. And of course, Cyrus the Great is known as a very good ruler uh, overall. He was an extremely talented uh, general and strategist. About 509 B.C., Rome throws off the Etruscan rule. So you remember the Etruscans were the neighbors, the powerful neighbors to the north of Rome. And Rome was on the seven hills of Rome, around uh, on the banks of the Tiber. And they throw off Etruscan rule at this point. Meanwhile, about 490 uh, BC, we have, uh, we're back to the uh, uh, Persians who are now attacking Greece. This is Darius, and he attacks the Greeks in the first major invasion, and he's thrown back at the Battle of Marathon. And then just 10 years later, in 480 BC, we have Xerxes. Xerxes is launching the second big invasion of the Greeks, and he brings his army by land, huge army, uh, upwards of a million men. They cross the uh, Bosporus, which back then was known as the Hellespont. They cross on 670, I think it's four, pontoon uh, boats across the Dardanelles, which is to, uh, used to be known as the Hellespont. And then he marches down into... Greece, And, of course, he's the one that the Spartans, the 300 Spartans uh, with King Leonidas, stop at them at the Battle of Thermopylae. And so 300 men hold back a million of these Persians. And so um, because uh, the, they've been held back, the Greeks have uh, gotten together, which they found very hard to do. They... they could not uh, form a union. They only uh, could have a lot of liberty with their city-states, but that was their flaw. They never were able to form any kind of strong union. And the Persians kept coming, but finally the Athenian navy um, was able to turn back at the Battle of Salamis, the Persian fleet. So uh, they inflicted a big defeat on uh, on the on the Persians, so Greece was saved from just being taken over. That's probably one of the great turning points of world history, is that liberty and Greek culture was preserved. It wasn't just swallowed up by an Eastern uh, dynasty that would trample on the rights of the people. So uh, these Oriental or Eastern dynasties have never been known to champion individual rights, but they swallow the individual up in uh, worship of the state or uh, labor for the state. The individual has only value as they can contribute to the power of the state for those oriental uh, dynasties. So... Let's move ahead, and we get now to the real humdinger of Greek history, the Peloponnesian Wars. And the Peloponnesian War 
between Sparta and Athens. Last 27 years, it has different phases. Uh, at first, Athens is winning, and then, of course, a plague breaks out, and their great statesman Pericles dies. I think he dies in 429 or 427. I can't remember, but it's early in the uh, in this conflict. Well, ultimately, Sparta uh, prevails, but the Greeks are so weak now that with a new... Uh, threat, they're unable to defend themselves. And in 334, Alexander uh, launches his invasion. He's from Macedonia. Now, Alexander actually conquers the entire world in just 11 short years. So it's phenomenal, his leadership, his generalship. But he dies tragically, if you recall, of over-drinking. 33 quarts of wine. Uh, So he uh, dies. So his empire is split up and not much comes of it, but he does unite the world and he does spread the Greek language and and Hellenism throughout every country of the world. Well, let's uh, mention that Rome, all this time, see, Rome is developing and It's gaining traction. It has conquered the Italian peninsula now. And now they face uh, their first big foe. Uh, They've they've overcome the Etruscans, and now they face the Carthaginians in the First Punic War. So that war starts in 264 B.C., and the Romans win it. And the Second Punic War... Is fought now. This is the one that's very, very famous because of Hannibal, the Carthaginian uh, general, and Hannibal is never defeated until the Battle of Zama, and Zama is 201. So another one of those big uh, decisive victories, and Rome wins that Second Punic War. The Third Punic War starts in 146, and that's the one where Cato has told the Romans over and over, Carthage must be destroyed, Carthage must be destroyed, and Cato has his way, and the Romans march down, and they wipe out Carthage, and they salt Carthage, and so it's never again a a city that can mount any kind of contest with Rome. Well, Rome is now the undisputed power of the Western Mediterranean, and they uh, keep gathering their power. And then we come to 55 uh, So in 55 BC, Caesar launches his First invasion of England. So Caesar is the proconsul of Gaul, and he has successfully conquered all of Gaul, which includes three main tribes, the Celts, the Aquitani, and the Belgae. And uh, he now launches an invasion of England. And that's the section that you will need to know in your uh, book, um, I would reread that section because there will be a number of questions pertaining to his invasion, his first invasion in 55 B.C. Uh, In 30 B.C., uh, Augustus Caesar takes control. And, of course, we've had the fall of the Roman Republic now. We're now into the empire. And... um, we have uh, this great period now from 30 A.D. to 180 A.D., known as Pax Romana, the Peace of Rome. And we have this uh, number of Roman emperors now. So see if you can name them off. Well, there's first Augustus, then who are the next four Julio-Claudian emperors? Well, let's think. T- uh, Tiberius. Caligula, Claudius, and Nero, okay? 
And then who are the three Flavian emperors? Vespasian, Titus, Domitian. And then the next five are the five good emperors. And we would say that's Nerva, then Trajan, then Hadrian, then Antonius Pius, and finally, last but not least, Marcus Aurelius. Okay, so that would be the emperors. And by the way, that's just about the spot. Marcus Aurelius dies, I think, in 180 BC. So this is actually uh, a kind of an interesting um, correspondence between these uh, 13 emperors and this 210 year period. So uh, the Pax Romana extends now in 295, the empire is permanently. So we come now to 313, and Constantine is the emperor of Rome. He issues the Edict of Milan, which declares that Christianity is now the uh, acceptable religion of the empire. It's the official religion, and uh, that's considered a pretty bad practice. The, the good that that does, however, is that it keeps Christians from being persecuted and thrown to the lions and uh, killed in the uh, in the different contexts of battle and gladiator fights. So that's a good thing, but it now results in a persecution of people in other religions. So uh, Constantine uh, makes himself the first Christian emperor, and he begins to uh, make an interesting alliance between the civil government of Rome, and the church, the Roman church. And so we begin to get this idea of a civil religious authority that kind of rules Rome. Maybe, in a sense, your first idea of a pope that kind of rules over all the churches comes about this time. Now, one of the things that Constantine does in 325 is he calls for a council of Nicaea. And this is where we get the Nicene Creed. And this is a council that is called to combat the um, Arian heresy. A man by the name of Arius uh, was saying that Jesus was not the Son of God. He was not divine. He, he was human, but he wasn't fully divine. And so that's one of the major things that the council in Nicaea deals with. The last of the really important dates, in my view, is 395. And this is where Theodosius uh, makes the uh, division of the empire permanent. This would be the first time this division into the western and eastern halves is made permanently. And, of course, that uh, western part under Rome uh, comes under attack from the barbarians, and it falls in 476. So we have the fall of the Roman Empire. But the eastern half of the empire, which we talked about last week, it extends all the way to 1453. And in 1453, it falls to the Muslim uh, attacks. Now we come to brand new material that we haven't covered before. And last week we mentioned how the, under Muhammad uh, the Muslim faith was born. Muhammad was born about 570 AD and he uh, developed uh, all of the major concepts, and wrote them in their holy book. So the holy book, the scriptures of the Muslim, uh, is called the Koran. So let's be sure we have that. This would be the Koran. Okay. 
And in it, uh, this was a book written by, um, by Muhammad. And uh, we mentioned that Muhammad uh, was very uh, aggressive and warlike and inaugurated and began the idea of jihad, which is a holy war waged against infidels to spread the Muslim religion. And so Muslims uh, will spread a, a very violent religion and uh, at the same time take over a country so it becomes an Islamic country or a Muslim country. And today we, we see that that's a major, kind of a major um, trend in today. Uh, we have uh, an entire country, uh, Iran, that became an Islamic republic just during my lifetime and uh, violently overthrew uh, their ruler and established a uh, Islamic government. And of course we have trouble with Islam and Iran because they want to blow Israel up and they want to blow the United States up. And so that's, uh, that becomes very, uh, you know, that's a big issue for us. So this idea of holy war is a war of conquest to spread Islam, and that's called jihad. Okay, now Muslims have a very great influence over the years and uh, in a number of areas, not all bad areas, I might add. In fact, it's kind of interesting. There are some very good things that they accomplished. Number one, uh, they are traders to Africa. And so they open up a lot of trade uh, to, uh, of Africa. Africa was seen as very mysterious, uh, kind of a dark continent. And so it prevented, this view prevented Europeans from going to Africa for centuries. But the Muslims, uh, the traders, open up trade with Africa. They also often adopt the culture of the conquered people. So once the Muslims conquered an area, instead of changing the culture of the people, they adopt the culture. So, for instance, you can go to Indonesia today, and Indonesia is way over just south of China, kind of directly south, way, way to the east, and Indonesia uh, has all its traditions, and it has its dress, and it has, um, you know, the way it educated, and uh, traders, and its art, but it's Muslim. It's like 95% Muslim. In fact, it's the most populous Islamic republic. Uh, number three, they're known for intellectual activities. So Muslims are well known for schools where they train um, particularly men in uh, the arts and in mathematics, etc. They excel uh, in their schools in physics, chemistry, the sciences. Uh, they excelled in astronomy. Uh, they, uh, for instance, uh, even in the area of uh, chemistry and drugs, they, they had developed and knew more than 1,400 different, if I can spell that word, different drugs. They use Arabic numerals, Arabic numerals, these numerals are the ones we use, uh, one, two, those are Arabic. So those are things that the Muslims developed, and on and on. So um, if we were not using Arabic numerals, we'd be still using Roman numerals, which would be extremely awkward and difficult. They also saved and translated many of the Greek works. So they had great libraries, which fits because they, they believed in a high level of education. So they translated many of the Greek works over the centuries 
So it's because of Muslim translators that we have some of those. Many great libraries, many great books. Uh, uh, two of the greatest books are the Rubaiyat, by Omar Khayyam and the Arabian Nights. And of course, the Arabian Nights are uh, the, the, the stories about um, uh, Aladdin and the Lamp and you know all of those great stories that Walt Disney has made millions of dollars uh, on as they've made movies um, for these Islamic people, Arabic is the official language, and it's known for its mosques. And of course, the mosque is their gathering for. Church, uh, they're not churches, for religious services. The mosques have very tall minarets. So let me give you a couple of those terms. The, there's usually a minaret on each corner of the mosque, and the minaret is uh, the place where uh, five times a day uh, the Muzans call for prayer. So it's every day, five times a day. And of course the Muslims will then get on their knees on their prayer rug, face the east, and pray five times each day. Now you can see a real good picture of a minaret on page 243. And um, it shows a very slender tower that is uh, used by... Uh, these criers to call people to prayer. Now, one of the things that we see at this time is feudalism. And feudalism is this system of, of uh, rule based on land ownership. So the kings owned all the land, and they would allow the serfs to farm and uh, till part of the soil, but they would also work for the uh, nobles and the king. And so there would be usually about three days that um, the serf would work for uh, the noble that owned the castle, who had built the castle, and in turn, um, you know, in, in turn for building roads and bridges and, and doing... Uh, all this work, the serf would get the protection of the noble and the king. And so it's a, you know, a, a kind of a trade-off. Uh, there's, there's benefits and uh, uh, there's difficulties that they had. On page 247, we see a, a great little passage. I like this passage about what the peasants and serfs did. The peasants provided for the manor in three ways. First, they donated up to three days' labor a week for projects such as repairing ditches, bridges, and manor, and the manor. They plowed, they sowed, and harvested the Lord's fields before caring for their own. Secondly, uh, so let's put down they had the labor uh, for three days per week. Secondly, they paid a tax, which was called a tollage. A tollage is a tax that went to the Lord. This was usually farm produce because money was difficult to have. They would pass on produce. But thirdly, they had to pay the Lords for uh, using their facility and uh, for the, the uh, castle. The Lord owned the oven for baking bread, the grain mill for grinding flour, the wine and the cedar presses, cider presses. And so each serf had his own piece of farmland 
but pastures and woods were owned by the entire village. Pigs were allowed to run free in the woods where they fed on acorns. There was a limit on how many pigs each person was allowed to feed there. Now some of you remember Ivanhoe and uh, Ivanhoe and the first scene where Gerth and Wamba are walking along and they're herding pigs and the pigs are just rooting up anything but eating acorns, etc. And so that's a, a real picture of the serfs. I think that's a very accurate picture. It's important to mention what's going on in England because England has such a unique um, history. It's separated from the mainland by the English Channel and so it, it develops differently. In fact, feudalism does not come to England until the Normans invade in 1066. So a little bit of background. Uh, most of the uh, inhabitants of England were Celts the same group that we see over in in Gaul when, that senior uh, that Caesar fights, and remember that in 55 A.D. Caesar invades England, and in his second invasion, which is uh, I'm sorry, 55 B.C. Uh, is 54 B.C. The second invasion takes England, so uh, the Romans are there and. Um, the uh, Celts dropped their pagan religion to become Christian uh, in about 300 A.D. So the Celts in Britain become Christian uh, around 300 A.D. And so uh, you, you remember the uh, previous religion were the Druids and the Celts uh, had these Druid priests. And the Druids practiced child's uh, sacrifices. They were a priesthood, uh, a uh, pagan priesthood. They painted their bodies blue. Uh, they had a Celtic um, culture. And then what happened is the Saxons invade. Uh, uh, the island, and they push the Celts uh, west into an area called Wales today. So Wales is in western uh, England. And uh, what happens is the Vikings also arise, uh, and you know that by 11 or by 1000, A.D., the Vikings are just all over the place. They're actually sailing even westward and reaching America. But the Vikings looted and, and killed uh, and pillaged. So I'd like to read a little section on page 255, and then I'm going to give you certain words that you should remember from that. So turn, to your, turn your, in your textbook to 255 and... The Norsemen sailed to other territories where they attacked and looted the people. These men were called Vikings. The word Viking comes from the term to go I Viking, which means to go raiding. So Viking raids were really for pillaging, looting, and destroying. They didn't go to conquer an area. They went to uh, take and sack the area. Let's look on uh, the next paragraph in, on page 255. If the Vikings were faced with a defending army, they simply returned to their ships and they found another place to raid. It was not a matter of being afraid. It was just that there were so many other places that could be raided without a fight. When a raid was, un was successful, the plunder was thrown into the boats. If there was enough room, they also took the women and children and sold them as slaves. So the Vikings were ruthless. Sometimes there were men called berserkers, and you want to know that term, berserker, in a crew. These men would become temporarily insane while in battle. They would throw away their shields and armor, wade into the thick of the enemy, and try to kill everyone. 
Sometimes, while traveling in the boat, a berserker felt a fit of insanity coming on. His friends would put him ashore so he could run wild, smashing trees with a sword or battle axe until it passed. We do not know for certain what caused these fits, but mostly, uh, most likely they resulted from the violent Viking lifestyle. So I'd like you to, to know there are raiders, they uh, were uh, berserkers. Now the Vikings also raided into England. In 865, the Danish Viking lands in, in England and began the conquest of that country. So we're on page 256, if you want to follow along. They soon controlled all of the eastern and northern parts of England. When they invaded western England, an area called the Kingdom of Wessex, they were stopped by a strong king named Alfred of Wessex. Now, Alfred actually uh, becomes a Christian, and he uh, fights against these Vikings and against... uh, the Saxons, and he pushes them to the east. And so we need to make a note of Alfred the Great. And this is why he's known as Alfred the Great, is that he frees the land of the western part of England called Wessex, and he pushes the Vikings out. And uh, when he became king... He set up a school to train the clergy, but was able to find only four educated people in his entire kingdom. Wow. Thus, Alfred started a revival in learning that lasted many years after his death. Because of his victories against the Vikings and his achievements in reestablishing Christian English learning, Alfred has gone down in history as King Alfred the Great. He's the only English monarch to be given this title. Okay? So, um, let's go to page, um, let's see, flip over to uh, the, uh, to page 261. And let's take a look now as, as feudalism uh, is in Europe, uh, what that means, the training of a knight. Well, let's look at the, it says the medieval knight. The society of the Middle Ages was harsh and brutal. These knights were the same barbaric tribesmen who only a few years before had destroyed the Roman Empire. In an effort to put the warrior in a more Christian setting and to slow down the brutal warfare of the period, a code of chivalry was established. Chivalry was a general code of conduct that all knights were supposed to follow. Could you write that down? That's what chivalry is. A general code of conduct that all knights were supposed to follow. Everything about the code of chivalry was designed especially for the knight. It set up standards for his training, his knighting, and his behavior, both in and out of battle. So it was like a total code of conduct for the knight. Let's look at the training. Only members of the nobility could become knights. A medieval boy of the noble class remained under the care of his mother until he turned seven. Then he began to train for knighthood. The boy was set to join another household, that of a relative, a friend, or a liege lord. It was believed that his own parents would spoil him if if he remained at home. In his new household, The boy slept in a dormitory with other boys, who also had come to train for knighthood. At first, the boy served as a page. He ran errands for the ladies and learned manners, religion, hawking, and hunting. The spirit of training was designed to teach the boy obedience. When a boy turned 15 or 16, he became a squire and was assigned to a knight. At that time, he was taught the arts of warfare. He learned how to ride a war horse and handle the sword, the shield, and the lance correctly. He also was required to care for his knight's equipment. He served his lord and their lady, their meals, and learned about music. He learned to play chess and backgammon, two popular games of the period. 
Because there were so many petty wars between the nobles, a squire usually was knighted on the battlefield after performing an act of bravery. Otherwise, a squire was considered ready for knighthood when he reached 21 years of age. Uh, now, I'd like you to write down that that knight at age 21 was considered to serve God in his role as a defender of the weak and helpless. And that was his role. He was to defend the, the weak and helpless, and he was to serve God in, in uh, a number of ways. For instance, if he saw someone being uh, hurt or taken advantage of, he was to stop that. If he saw a woman who was being taken advantage of or someone who was forcing himself on a woman or taking advantage of her weakness or whatever, uh, he was to stop that. If he would see a Muslim, it was interesting, if he saw a Muslim that was trying to uh, advance the Muslim uh, religion, he was to uh, draw that man into battle. Okay, So um, the three classes in the Middle Ages, I'm going to write that down here, we had three basic classes. We had the uh, nobles who had uh, royal blood or landed, uh, had, had possessions, a castle, so they were in noble families. There were the serfs or peasants, and there were the clergy, and the clergy, of course, were from um, the uh, from the church, so they would be in monasteries or they'd be pastors. Let's go on to our next um, part now.